All right, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Devine from the Tech Collective. I want to thank you all for coming this afternoon for this uh, first event in our Ethics and Data series. Our um, our cyber our steering committee for data has uh, been working on trying to envision events programs for us to have for um, about six months now, and this was one of the topics that really um, came up very early in our conversations about things that we thought would be important to uh, to start considering and start evaluating. You know, where does where is ethics now, and where should it be? Um, Joan Peckham uh, introduced us all to a book uh, by Kathy O'Neill, which she's going to talk a lot about today, which was kind of a big inspiration for this. And uh, we just really appreciate Joan and uh, Doug from, uh, well, actually, you're going to get introductions in a second. Let me really introduce <laughs> Rob Olmschneider Ol uh, from Trilex, who is uh, on our steering committee for our data um, steering committee and uh, is also uh, an executive with uh, Trilex and is responsible for the data program. Uh, thank you for volunteering today to moderate this, Rob. And uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, absolutely, and it's great to be here. Um, you know, as you said, uh, Joan introduced me and a ton of other people to uh, Kathy O'Neill's book. I would say about eight months ago. I think that uh, Kathy O'Neill owes a debt to uh, Joan for being <laughs> the local representative. I think she should get a commission on all the books. That in Rhode Island. But uh, so we have with us today uh, Dr. Joan Peckham. She's a professor of computer science at the University of Rhode Island, and she coordinates the big data and data science initiatives there. And also Doug Friedman, who's a data science manager at Johnson & Johnson's Healthcare Technology Center in Providence. And I've talked to each of Joan and Doug about this topic in the past. It's so, so important. Um, and so it was even before, uh, you know, the coronavirus pandemic really started. This was one of the things that we knew we wanted to talk about, but it's really become such a, a significant issue, even in you know the mainstream uh, press and and even people who don't work with data every day. We're really, I mean, we're seeing it every day. We're we're, we're seeing discussions about about the curve and different approaches to data and how so many different perspectives can look at the same issue in different ways and in, in some ways because of you know, what result that they want to reverse engineer. So we're going to talk about uh, 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 data ethics in general. And uh, if you saw in the Eventbrite info, uh, there was a link to Kathy O'Neill's TED Talk. If you haven't got a chance to see that, I'm going to paste the link into the meeting chat right now. Please obviously see it afterwards because we want you to listen to what <laughs> Joan and Doug have to say about it. But we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that and some of the issues that she raises in that book. So um, I just want to, uh, uh, before I get going here, if you have any questions that come up throughout the course of the conversation today, uh, just put, paste them right in the chat. I'll be looking at those as the as 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 we progress with what uh, Joan and Doug have to say. And towards the end, we'll take some of your questions and raise them to our panelists. Uh, so yeah, p please feel free to post those as they come up. Uh, but we'll leave some time at the end to discuss those. But uh, Joan, I want to start with you. Um, so, you know, obviously you've been a big driver for this topic. Uh, tell me what data ethics means to you and why you think it's such an important topic for everyone involved in data science and analytics. Okay. okay. So I come from uh, computer science and, you know, f for many decades we thought that we could just write code, create technology, put it out there and that we would be held harmless for anything that happened to, to people. And I think all, you know, all of us have read in, in the press uh, about things that uh, the implications of technology and now in this era of data. The decisions that we make, uh, policies that we set, the treatments that we provide to people um, are influenced by um, data. And um, I think that we definitely need to think very deeply about that. It has implications for um, uh, how it impacts people's lives, the right to life, liberty, privacy, and way of life. Um, Decisions that you make using data can influence the success of your business. And you certainly would want to do the right thing for your, your employees. So here today we're not going to I I we're not going to discuss the sort of foundational um, philosophical uh, uh, constructs with regard to ethics. We're just going to define ethics as to do the right thing, to do the legal thing. 
to be consistent with policy that all of us in this this country and, and around the world have agreed upon are the the right things to do. Do no harm. Think about a Hippocratic oath for for um, data scientists. Great. And now, and now, Doug. Um, so you come at this from a bit of a different perspective. You know, as Jones from academia, you're from industry. So you know, in your everyday, how does data come? How does how does ethics come up when you're working with data in the real world? Sure. I think that's a good question. So I think kind of touching on what Joan said, right, is that when it comes to data ethics, I think it can be deceptive because there's this narrative that if it's data driven, then it's objective and independent. And so the, you know, the ethicality is already kind of made for you. But the truth is, is that a lot of the data that we look at to analyze or to make these types of decisions is heavily influenced by the way that we collect it by the way the measures we use to analyze it right like an average is not always the best way to evaluate something even just using simple statistics i mean my background's in statistics so that's the example i always drift towards but um you know there are a lot of different things you have to think to and when it comes to the way that we kind of analyze data johnson johnson what we really try to focus on is what is the provenance of this data where did it come from can we trust it and if so are there potential biases in the way this data was collected that we have to take into account when we do a later analysis i think it's a lot of not taking data on face value but still using it to make a data-driven decision mm -hmm. so uh oh, i'm sorry joan go ahead i i just wanted to mention that this also um, connects to the um the data analysis techniques that we choose, whether it's a statistical or machine learning, or is it the sort of gold standard of statistics that, that we always use? Um, are the uh, assumptions that we're making uh, consistent with um, being able to use this, this model um, for doing analysis? I can even give an example of where uh, using um, comparison groups uh, where you're treating one group and not another group in order to draw a conclusion may may be unethical because withholding a treatment that is extremely promising and that in the past has shown to be effective could uh, negatively impact one group of people. So for example, when deciding whether to provide many grants to small for small businesses in Africa, if you use a quasi-experimental technique, which is not the gold standard, and look at the past data or the historical data, and you have great evidence that this is effective, or well, it's the same in, in education, withholding treatment from a whole class for a whole year when you have historical evidence that, um, um, that this is effective. So there are a lot of decisions that you make when you're, when you're using data that can influence, um, you know, it can impact individuals and groups. Mm. I think it's easy for a lot of us to look at what we do, those of us that work with data, and sort of otherize this issue because we can say, oh, I know I'm ethical. I know that my heart's in the right place. Um, but I, I think, and I, and I know that each of you agree, that a lot of the issues that come up, they're not uh, people acting intentionally unethical. They're, you know, issues with subconscious, unconscious institutional bias that just get built into the underlying assumptions in our model. So, you know, Joan, talk a little bit about that, about how how much these issues are, not necessarily anyone acting in a nefarious way, but just the natural course of events. Right. So um, when we're dealing with data, you can think of it as a pipeline. And in reality, it's a, it's a cycle where we revisit and so on. But if you think of it as a pipeline to simplify, um, the first thing we need to do is collect data. Are you collecting the right data? Are you taking the right sample? Do you trust that the subjects are giving a truthful response? Um, we work in models after all. A model is never 100% of reality. Are you choosing the right model for even collection? Um, it, are, is this data going to be uh, give us the information that we need to, to make the decisions we need to make? Once you've collected the data, you need to organize it, curate it, and clean it. Are you tossing out data and cleaning it because it looks like an anomalous piece of data that might mean nothing? But in fact, you might be tossing out something that reflects reality and could influence the decisions that you make with regard to um, policy and, and treatment and so on. So you might be omitting data. 
um, that 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 could lead to a breakthrough. Um, you know, giving a, a kind of example, the 3M invention of stickies. <laughs> they were trying to create a glue that was very powerful and strong, but someone noticed that um, actually they weren't successful. Um, they they got something that you could stick and restick and so on and and so you're what you're doing is eliminating information about something that you know it looks like a failure it's an outlier or something that we're not going to use mm -hmm. um, once you collect the data and you clean it organize it then you archive it and place it in a repository so my area of expertise is data modeling if you're using a relational database if it's not uh, normalized then the data that, that when you go back to, uh, to uh, access the data, you're not going to have the correct information, okay? Or you're not always will be true, but it's likely that you may get incorrect results. So um, just you know, figuring out how you're going to archive the data for later access is going to be really important. And then you need to access the data. You need an expert who, who knows how to ask questions on this archive that you have of data. Um, and if they're writing the wrong queries, then, then again, you're not going to have accurate data. And then the modeling and analysis, everyone is, is highly focused on that. Um, you know, it, are we using the right, the right group? And, and are we going to be analyzing it correctly? And I mentioned this earlier, Every statistical technique has a set of assumptions that are made about the nature of the data. If your data is not a good match or is not consistent with those assumptions, then you're going to be getting garbage. And so you need to, to appeal to the expert. And at the, at the very end is the communication and visualization of the data. How do you communicate this to your stakeholders? And what kind of discussions are you going to be having with um, the domain experts who uh, will be able to look at what your analysis is producing and tell you whether this makes sense or not. Is this grounded in any theory or any information or knowledge that we have about this domain of education or business or health or, you know, any or um, politics or any other um, um, domain that we, we may be working in? We can't do this independently. So, so it's a whole, it's a whole series of steps yep. in it. It's a cycle, and if we make missteps at one or more of those places, we could, you know, be um, running on incorrect information. Yeah. So, Doug, looking at that, you know, Joan laid out a good picture of the the data pipeline and the problems you see along the way, and I'll I'll add one element to it as well. You know, post communication and visualization, the actual decision making by, by mm. business users is also a place where, you know, we can introduce another set of problematic biases. Doug, what do you see uh, from from those, from, from that timeline? Where do you see the problems manifest the most? So th that's a really good question. I think for me, a, a lot of the, I wouldn't say blame, but a lot of the origin of the problem lies in the initial discussions of how a data science project or an analysis project starts off, is that at least from kind of my experience at this job and previous jobs, someone very high up at a company, right, has a really good idea and they're like, well, we've got this data and it's just sitting in this room or this database, we should just analyze it. And then we could answer all these questions. I read this really awesome article on LinkedIn, we should just move forward with it. It's pretty easy, right? <laughs> and so you laugh, but really that's how a lot of these projects get started, right? And so by the time it kind of filters its way to someone like me who does data science, you're kind of like, Mm, all right, like let's really talk about what you're doing here. And I think the intentionality piece that you were talking about, Rob, is really key, right? Because the intention is good. Because really to them, what they've heard is all this data that I've been storing for, for years, and in J&J's case, sometimes even decades, right? It, it's data is the new oil, right? I'm sitting on this huge kind of oil reserve. I should tap into it and do something with it. But really there needs to be this kind of uh, whole process at the beginning, um, of really what I call rejecting the premise or skepticism, right, of like, can you really say, make these conclusions based on this data? Was this data really collected to answer this question, right? And I think the thing that we often find, especially you know, now at my time at J&J, &J, is the data was collected for regulatory purposes. So the FDA said you had to collect this, so that way we could audit you. But that data wasn't necessarily collected to make business decisions all the time. And so trying to find a balance between the two, where maybe you don't make a causal you know, 
summary, maybe you make some sort of observatory claim. Like I think it's all in kind of the art of the deal at the beginning of that scoping process. And I think there's been some really, really fantastic advancements in that from like Microsoft's team data science process, where they take a lot of the lessons learned from the agile software world and scoping things at the beginning and asking some of those tough questions and putting it at the beginning of data science projects because it's really, really hard to adjust for that stuff after the fact, after you've done the analysis, after you've collected the data. But having those conversations up front, I think really forces you to have those conversations of what can we really do here? Can we achieve this kind of lofty goal? Mm. Now, I want to I want to pivot to uh, to Kathy O'Neill's uh, well, her TED Talk and her book. I, I mentioned the TED Talk and I posted that for any attendees that haven't seen it, I put it in the meeting chat. But she also wrote a book called Weapons of Math Destruction, um, which a, a number of us have read. And uh, Joan, the, the subtitle of that book is How Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. As a thesis, do you agree with that and why or why not? So I, I would consider Kathy O'Neill as kind of carrying a big stick and trying to, she wants to club us over the head to help mm. us to understand that, um, so big data, what is it? It's, it's unruly data. It's, it's not only big or huge in volume, but it's data that doesn't yield well to traditional techniques of analysis. And now we have these algorithms, which she talks about, um, that um, you know are speeding up the process and coding into this process. Um, you know certain certain I well the data that we we feed into it, for example. And um, she's really concerned, I think. Um, and this is my read on the book: is that um, if if um, big data is handled inappropriately, yes. If 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 you know. The average voter does not know how to understand the data, or or we as citizens don't know how to understand what the government is trying to tell us about this this uh, pandemic that's going on. It's it can wreak um, quite a bit of havoc, or um, you know, worse if they were um, making inappropriate assumptions on on the data. Um, you know that that and that could be a topic of another discussion, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just focus on on that. So I think that what she's trying to say is that if we don't do this right, then it can wreak havoc on the world. And and good news is that she has developed um, techniques um, such as the ethical matrix that she talks about that helps us, and maybe Doug could talk more about that. I see him nodding his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, I, but yeah. I was just going to jump in and say that, yeah, I think that there have been some fantastic advancements in using those same techniques to create um, like fairness and ethicality measures that you can apply programmatically, right? Like this isn't something that only can take place, you know, in a philosophic Socratic discussion, right? Like you can actually add these measures to your code as guardrails. They're not going to be as good as a human making ethical decisions, but they can give you, be an early warning system for a, a big data set that you could not conceivably kind of have a Socratic discussion all the way through, right? And we've come really, really far, and it's about raising kind of the awareness of these and how to implement them in your own code. Yeah. Doug, we've talked about uh, some of the other things that are similar to, you know, O'Neill's matrix. We, we've talked about uh, AI Fairness 360, and you mentioned some frameworks that uh, you know you've put into place on your team. Talk about some of the things that that you do in your team um, to dip, that you've deployed for the purpose of making sure you flag these ethical issues early in the process. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I'd say that one of the things we do to start every project is kind of a really comprehensive literature review on the subject matter and then on the techniques that would be used. And I think to Joan's point. The technique literature review is really focused on what are the biases or potential assumptions that are involved that we have to meet and can we meet them? And then I think the subject matter one is really designed to look at who's researched this problem for, what problems have they run into, and if they're ethical ones, have we asked these questions yet? Mm. And I think uh, one of the examples that I always use is we were asked uh, last year to build a predictive model for surgical candidates for total knee replacement because J and J makes prosthetic knees, and so. Um, they gave us a whole bunch of data about individuals, some of which may or may not have been appropriate to include. But I think the ethical question was really complicated because it had stuff about their nationality or ethnicity, 
which you know arguably could be included in the model to increase accuracy, but um, may not unnecessarily discriminate or you know get, reinforce certain societal biases around who is and is not a good surgical candidate. But the difficulty became uh, whether or not they had medical value. So would a doctor in that scenario, not an algorithm, make that same decision based on certain medical conditions that follow certain national or ethnic, um, you know, lines of inquiry? And so that was kind of a longer discussion. We had to go back to literature to talk about, to talk to some surgeons and some people who determine surgical candidates. And I think oftentimes it's not quite as easy as saying, oh, this is all good or this is all bad. It's a balance of what decisions are you making and are you being as transparent as possible when making them? Mm. You know, you know, going back to O'Neill for a second, uh, Doug, one of the things that she says in, in her TED talk and in the book as well, um, she defines algorithms as in opinions embedded in code. Uh, would you agree with, agree with that definition of an algorithm and talk a little bit about the impact that opinion and bias have on algorithm design when you're, you know, modeling data systems? Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. I think also... Uh, a lot of the code or kind of what Joan said about the data cleaning steps is where the strongest opinions come through, right? When you throw out those extreme values because you think they're not real. I think the example that always comes to mind is we spent about two months last year building a predictive model for uh, predicting the correct finance code for when you expend something at J&J. I know it's not always the most sexy example, but it is something that we ended up doing. And so after the fact, um, they said, actually, we realized that the data you had represents actual users, you know, reporting their own finance codes. And I said, well, that's good, right? Because we're 75 percent accurate. That's that's pretty good. And they said, well, they get it wrong most of the time. And I was like, well, how often do they get it wrong? And they said, you know, about like 90 percent of the time. And so <laughs> I said, OK, well, we trained the algorithm to make the wrong prediction as often as a human would. And they were like, well, doesn't the algorithm know what the right answer is? And I said, <laughs> no. I said, well, the algorithm doesn't work at Johnson Johnson. It has no idea what the finance codes are, right? Like it learned from the humans. And so what I would explain to them is that the algorithms, right, are certainly opinionated, but by the data you give them. So really what we did was amplify a pre-existing opinion that every human at J&J had that, you know, this is not a pen and paper expense. And we weaponized it, like Kathy O'Neill talks about, to the point where if they had deployed this, the finance team would have been overwhelmed with the wrong finance charges, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's, for me, it's not just embedded opinions, but it amplifies the opinion you find in that data to a point that it's really, really hard to catch up to it if you release it without really thinking it through. Yeah. You know, your story reminds me of something else that O'Neill says uh, when she talks about uh, sort of a, a another hidden consequence of building algorithms is it allows you almost to personify a culprit that isn't anybody, right? Like, oh, the algorithm did that. And, uh, you know, it reminds me sort of uh, like, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas and the unmoved mover, like, you know, who built that algorithm? Oh, an AI built that algorithm. Well, who built the AI? You know, <laughs> at some point a human had to do something and embed some opinions into this system that caused this error that we're, we're, we're faced with right now. <laughs> There's even a stronger word you can use beyond embed. We train yep. many of these algorithms. Mm. So, so Joan, speaking about algorithms and and what oh, you know how O'Neill defines them, I think she uses a a, a really uh, simple construct for it, which is good because she's you know communicating to a non technical audience. But she says for an algorithm, you need two things: you need past data and a definition of success. So when we look at ethical issues that arise, what do you think is more of the culprit usually, that definition of success or issues with the past data that we're training into it? I think both. Mm -hmm. I really think both. Although the the definition of success can, um, you know, in many of the examples that, that you give, uh, it's mixed. You know, they, I talked about the school teachers, definition of success, uh, improve scores by a certain percentage and you will continue to get your funding. That's a clear uh, sort of error in the definition of success. Um, but then when we think of, um, of training, for example, um, you've probably all read in the press about these automated techniques for uh, reviewing applications for jobs. Mm. And so those that's a perfect example of um, the data um, 
of humans making decisions on applications, informing or the or the algorithm being trained with that data, um, and in embedding or encoding those biases that humans have uh, within the algorithm. So I would say that the both of them, but I think I think that she was trying to hold. Uh, the the data and the algorithm harmless and try to point to the humans who collect, clean, organize the data, and the humans who train and and, and encode the the algorithms um, to think carefully about what they're doing. Yeah, it's, it's too easy it, to to wash our hands of it if we blame an algorithm because oh we can't mm -hmm. do it that right. But you know there is there is ultimately a human cause. I, I want to just remind our, our audience that if you have any questions for Joan or Doug, uh, please post them in the chat. We've already gotten a couple here um, and we'll leave some time at the end to answer some of your questions, uh, you know, once uh, Joan and, and Doug have made all their points. Um, Joan, there's a criticism of weapons of mass destruction that for a book about data science, it's heavy on anecdotes and perhaps light on data that supports some of O'Neill's points. Um, what would you say to that criticism? I would say that O'Neill is suffering um, the difficulty of trying to communicate to, uh, to a broad audience. She was not doing uh, a scientific data analysis of um, where algorithms are going wrong or how often they're going wrong. She was trying to point out, and anecdotes are a very a good way of uh, helping people to to recognize that 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 sometimes things can go wrong. Um, mm -hmm. I and so for me, um, you know, even as you know, someone who has studied mathematics, a little bit of statistics, and and um, quite a bit of computer science, I, I found her book enlightening in that she, you know, as I described it, she has a big club. She's trying to wake us up and give us some examples of where things could go wrong. And then the experts and the data scientists can go back and begin to think about, and as she has now with her ethical matrix and, and other techniques, think about how, you know, we can, how things are going wrong in, in our environment and how we might be able to remediate or correct and educate our students so that they're alert to the these possibilities so that yeah. that didn't bother me at all I've, I've read that online as well so yeah you know i like the book clearly <laughs> <laughs> of course uh i i think you know you've mentioned a couple of times her using a big club and uh you know i think she's also trying to serve as a counterbalance because yeah. how many books are there out there about the promise of data and all mm -hmm. that it can do and all of the cool things that companies have done, but how many of them actually take a step back and say, let's pump the brakes and make sure that we're, as you said at the beginning, do the right thing. So um, it's, a, it's a message that needed to be communicated and uh, you know the, the, the counter message is out there. I mean, there's so many people that are talking about what good the data, and we've even talked about it a little bit in this discussion. Um, uh, Doug, uh, this is a question for you uh, because you know, you're coming from the private industry. Uh, O'Neill talks about uh, one of the examples that she raises is, uh, you know, uh, teacher test scores um, and really having difficulty. Uh, actually, she found it impossible to, to look in the algorithm because uh, a third party firm had put it together for I believe it was for the city of New York and it was proprietary. So even if firms wanted to be more transparent and we really hope that they that they will, how can they balance, you know, protecting their secret sauce? with that sort of transparency that we need to really see what an algorithm is doing? So I, I think that's a good question, right? And I think sometimes we let the IP concerns and the intellectual property concerns get ahead of what is logical and what is fair a lot of times. Is mm -hmm. that, I mean, most of the time as a data scientist, you're not cooking up, you know, as a practicing one, you're not cooking up new ways to analyze the data, right? Like most of the time you're using pre-existing libraries, a lot of pre-existing methods. And these methods are based on like open source papers and math for a long time, right? And I think the transparency that you have to provide when you release something like this is essential. Maybe you don't have to release the code if you're not able to release it for whatever legal reasons, but you can at least talk about, and I think um, there's a fantastic framework called model cards that do this. 
talk about what data, as Joan was saying, was used to train this. What are some of the limitations of applying this or assumptions that are involved? And let people know if they're going to use your model or to try and interpret the results. And then if you have had some ethical discussions, be explicit about what ethical discussions you had and what the outcomes were. And I think kind of going back to what Joan was saying too, the, what was the metric for success here? How did you define it? How did you actually collect the data involved with it so that other people understand what your aim is? I think the best example I could think of is when you look at what's popular on YouTube, right? They're always changing the algorithm, but they're not very transparent as to like what the success metric is, right? Is, is the metric how many people comment? Is the success how many views? Is it how long people stay on a page? Instead, what you see is people reverse engineering what that algorithm success metric is by looking at what the most popular videos are. And you can watch like any number of YouTube videos that are meta commentary on the algorithm if you really wanted to. But it's really, really interesting because there's no reason they couldn't be transparent about it, right? It's not like, you know, nations are gonna rise and fall if we understand why this video is popular and this one's not. But it's one of those things that I think causes a lot of consternation, even about something as unimportant about YouTube views, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we don't need the relative weights, you know, we don't need the actual uh, uh, coding that goes into it, but it would be nice to know sometimes uh, what is a, a positive factor and a negative predictor for what will be a successful post on Facebook, on LinkedIn, what, what have you. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to talk for a little bit about you know COVID-19 because I don't think we can avoid it. Uh, I know that we're going to have another uh, or planning on having another discussion potentially uh, entirely on the data and ethical implications of, of COVID-19. But Joan, you know this whole crisis have, has brought ethics into a sharp focus. Can you talk to us about some of the misrepresentations and misuse of data that we've seen, especially in terms of communication and decision making? So. I think the communication probably was is is probably the biggest issue, um, and in comparing um, uh, numbers on on um, between among countries and among states and and so on, I think that that um, so we we seem hyper focused on the number of cases mm. in each state, and, but every state has a different size. And I personally would be more interested in on the percentage of of cases in in the state. Um, I think that many of the graphs that are shown, um, at least on the on the federal level, they're making use of um, a logarithmic scale, which is is effective and needed when you have um, a long ranges of, of numbers on one on one axis or the other, but many people don't understand that this is a, a not a linear but a multiplicative scale, and don't know how to interpret the data. So I think that, um, and I wouldn't it, I wouldn't want to stand here and criticize the the uh, the way in which they're, well, I mean. Collecting data, <laughs> collecting. Okay, so the collection of data, um, we had some problems with supply chains and and the development of tests and so on. So we weren't we were having to make decisions based on incomplete data, which means we have to use those quasi experimental techniques that I talked about before that fill in, uh, help to fill in um, what what missing data might be. So I don't want to criticize about why we <laughs> haven't been able to collect that data quickly enough. Um, I don't want to stand in that position right now, but I think that, um, you know, probably the, the statisticians um, and the mathematicians who have been working with the data have probably been doing a marvelous job given the, the information that they have. And I don't think we, any of us know enough about exactly how they were doing these analyses. And that, actually that might um, address the fact that whenever you're communicating data, it's really important. And, to um, to be clear about the assumptions that you're making and be able to communicate to a broad audience how you're drawing the conclusions so that people can understand why certain policies are being put in place. Generally, they've they've done a reasonable job, but you know, as as 
you might say there there have been some gaps and lacks in policy and so on. And maybe Doug, you you as a statistician, <laughs> yeah, will be more critical than, than I am. But uh, I, so I think the thing that I'm the most critical of is that it's fantastic that the data is out there and so soon, right? Like you, if you look back, like what, like you you know, ten years ago, right? Even before then, getting up to the date data every single day to update these interactive charts and graphics would have been impossible. And it's fantastic that it's out there, but you see um, what I kind of see all the time, right? Is like all this kind of Monday morning quarterbacking on these charts where it's like, you know, logarithmic scale or not, I don't think the curve looks that flat to me, or I think it was flat to begin with. And it's like, I think what you see a lot of is the analysis of this data divorced from an understanding of the context and the opinion, uh, expert opinion that it should be paired with, right? Is that you see all these people, especially like on Twitter, you see it all the time, they're tweeting the same graphic with completely different interpretations when really there is you know, a, a scientific consensus for the most part about this type of stuff. And I think the democratization of the data is fantastic, but I think you also have to be really, really careful to make sure that people are not interpreting it wrong or misunderstanding how that data was collected to begin with. I think the in Rhode Island we saw, especially there was like an intense amount of pandering. I don't know if people saw this, um, about last week when they updated the figures because they were reporting the hospital discharges wrong. Mm -hmm. And so um, I remember I followed the WPRI data guy on Twitter. And so he had to update all his charts twice in the same day. And he was like freaking out because he was like, the data is all wrong. And I was just kind of laughing to myself. And I was like, we get wrong data all the time. Of course, <laughs> this is a lot more serious, right? But the idea is, is that like, it's really hard to make a decision when there is so much data quality and data provenance in question, right? And I think that little update affected where we were in terms of flattening the curve significantly. And that was, I think, just one hospital um, or a set of hospitals that just were had a coding reporting error, right? Or a misunderstanding of what their coding was. So it really goes to show you that understanding kind of what all of those elements might be beforehand can have a huge impact on what the end result or interpretation might be. Yeah. So that that also feeds into my as an educator the importance of you know I spent a lot of time first um, at when, I, when I was a program director at the National Science Foundation when we defined computational thinking and one of the big assertions was that everyone needs to know computing and understand it I think is even more so true about data. If I do anything in retirement, I think it'll be to go out to the public schools and to begin to work with people because the people who report the data are the people who govern, are the people, the citizens who are listening uh, um, and making decisions uh, on who they're going to vote for, for based on the types of policies that are being made. All of us need to understand the data and question it. I, I you know, to the point about, you know, the different interpretations of, of the data that we're looking at right now. I saw a chart recently um, and it was a chart on the data out of Georgia. Um, and what they've done recently is they've decided to sort of backdate their cases to when they estimate uh, someone might have been infected rather than when the case was reported. So, Joan, this goes back to what you said about, you know, communicate your assumptions. Right on the chart itself at the bottom, in clear text, it says the last 14 days of data may not be complete. And yet you still have a trend line that shows, hey, in the last 14 days, cases have really gone down. And this is being used to, you know, <laughs> to justify that George is doing really well. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's another testament to two people can look at the same data and draw different conclusions um, just depending on what outcome they want to reach. So this goes really to the heart of what it is that mathematicians do, what statisticians do, and machine learning people do. Everything that we do and has to do with modeling. We're making models of reality. No model is ever going to be complete. Mm -hmm. And so it's really difficult to make those decisions along that sort of pipeline that I talked about. Um, of deciding which model, which data you're going to collect, how you're going to clean it, how you're going to interpret it and analyze it. Um, you know, it's, it's you, there, there will always, as Doug mentioned, there's always missing data. It's always easy to misinterpret the data. And um, so I guess, you know, what was that quote about statistics is um, an uncertainty? 
That's what a you know what a statistician is who, who um, you know that's what statisticians do. They not only make these calculations, but they also produce a certain probability of of uncertainty. So, all of us, for example, thought that uh, Hillary Clinton was going to be elected president. And what was Nate Silver's and the the statisticians that I do know? What was their response? Well, we said there was a twenty percent probability that Trump would win. And that 20% happens 20% of the time. So it, it was not a huge surprise to the statisticians, okay. but to everyone else, because that's we assume a, that it was certain that she was going to win. Well, and I think, too, that's a layperson data literacy issue. You know, if I look at something, I, I think there are people that if you tell them there's a 51% chance that, you know, whichever candidate is going to win, they read that as they're going to win. <laughs> you know, because they see that as a binary uh, thing, but they don't really understand the statistical implications of that. So I'm going to ask one last question before I, uh, you know, open it up for some Q&A. And I want to bring this back to business, but talking a little bit about what we were just talking about. Um, Doug, one of the things that I'm seeing with the with the COVID reporting, you know, it, hey, it's a situation that's ripe for data. And it's really fun even for some of us to try to play around with these numbers. But I see... Uh, I see public health analysis where nobody talked to an epidemiologist. I see economic analysis where nobody talked to an economist. So how do you, in, in your role, when you're doing a study, uh, when you're putting together a system, how do you involve the actual business user to get that real world context that you need? And how do those sort of inter interdisciplinary teams work together to combat ethical issues? Yeah, so I, I think that's a fantastic question. And I think part of you know what we've been talking about, right, is recognizing your own, you know, areas of expertise and your own areas for potential bias. And I think um, I'm always the first to admit at work, even though I work for J and J, I am not a medically inclined person. I don't know anything about medicine, right? I read all the labels and all my medicine. It doesn't make me any better at it. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, is that when we do an analysis of pharmaceutical data or when we build these models, for example, like I was talking about about surgical candidates you have to have subject matter experts in the loop as part of that project. So, you know, if you're operating in something like an agile development process, every time the development team gets together, you have that to me available to talk to, to just ask questions, right? And I think a lot of, you know, questions we ask me is are, we're seeing X, does that make any sense, right? And I think a lot of times what you hear is, oh no, that doesn't make sense. Or actually if that does make a lot of sense. Let's make sure that we check that this is the case, right? And it has to be an iterative process and a teaming process where you don't just hand the data to data scientists and they hand you back conclusions, right? They should work with you integrated as a part of that team and subject matter experts to make sure that they're interpreting that data in the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think going to back to what Joan was saying, right, is when you look at the way that we educate data scientists or we encourage people to get involved in data science, right? Like I get tons of people who ask me, how do I get involved? We send them to something like Kaggle.com which is a, a data science competition to get the highest accuracy. But really, in the business world, we're not aiming to get the highest accuracy. We're aiming to get the most complete, unbiased, or as best we can, least opinionated model of the data. And a lot of time, that is, the end result is not an accuracy percentage, but a thorough discussion of the pros and cons of different approaches. And so I think it really has to start not just with data literacy for the general public, but how we actually talk about um, the goals of data science with people who are training to become data scientists and are data scientists, right? That like not everything can be a Kaggle competition or the Netflix accuracy recommendation system, right? That it has to be a really kind of detailed discussion of what the pros and cons of certain approaches are um, and how do you loop other people in. Joan, anything to add to that about, you know, how teams can work together to, to combat these issues? Well, you, you probably know me well enough to know this goes right to the heart of one of my big passions, which is interdisciplinary engagement. And th that end of the sort of end of the pipeline, working with the experts is extremely important, probably one of the most important aspects. But we also need the, the statisticians to be able to talk to the, t the technicians, and we need the um, the, all everyone to be able to talk to the visualization and communications experts. Um, this is what I would call, you know, and my group of scholars called no boundary thinking and what the National Science Foundation now calls convergence. 
everybody hands on working on the same problem. Maybe the pipeline is the wrong, um, the wrong picture of this because you you don't want to you know be as Doug said you don't just want to be handing off from one one step to the other. Everybody these teams need to be well integrated and they all need to be talking to each other and everyone should have a stake in each stage. Of, of the processing and, and the interpretation and then the policy making of, of data. Thank you for that, Joan. So uh, at this time, I want to uh, encourage again, encourage uh, folks who are uh, you know listening to the conversation. If you have any questions for Dave, I'm sorry for uh, I'm going to I'm going to raise a question from Dave. But if you have any questions for Joan or Doug, uh, please feel free to post them in the chat. So. Uh, Doug, this first question is from Dave Marble at Ocean. Uh, he he said the privacy concerns, especially in healthcare, is hindering research. Most recently, COVID research silos exist everywhere, limiting our ability to gain valuable regional or even global perspectives. Are you encouraged that we will overcome this impediment with new ways to anonymize PHI, uh, protected health information data sets? So I. Yeah, I think I also have privacy concerns personally, right, but also Sometimes in the data we get, I also, you know, am concerned. But I think that there has been this fantastic kind of cottage industry of people who are very, very good at anonymizing, or sometimes as referred to fuzzing up individual data in a way that shouldn't affect the end statistical result, but protects individuals or sensitive individuals. And the example I always come back to with this is the Census Bureau. You can analyze as detailed a, a, in areas you could possibly get even individual responses in the census, but they kind of fuzz up some of the responses here and there to make sure that you can't identify your neighbor and figure out everything about them, right? And I think the idea is that has kind of been expanded out to the healthcare industry where we are getting data sets like that, where they're like, don't focus too much on a singular patient, but you could still do analysis of this. And I think um, the application of, they're sometimes called like privacy or, or kind of data privacy algorithms, right? To the healthcare world has really opened up our ability to do so. I think the other big thing has been um, being able to collect more than what's called PROs or patient reported outcomes. So usually when you go to your doctor, right, they ask, how are you feeling? And you respond. And so that process is, let's say, not objective, right? Because you're having a bad day. You're not going to say, I'm feeling terrible. You want to seem upbeat. But being able to do something like, you know, wear a wearable, right, gives objective measurement as to what my heart rate is all of the time. And so what we're seeing is, is that we're pairing these PROs, these patient reported outcomes with wearable data and that's giving us much better insight into the when we had data beforehand, how accurate was that really? How accurate is a person reporting their own outcomes or health metrics? Joan, anything to add on that? I'm all set. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, we, got, we got another question here from Scott Moody. Um, I was curious about the ways to address breaching more ethical data con conversations with my peers without sounding like a distraction to our business objective. I like Doug's response about building the ethical conversation into the pre-build development activities. What was the evolution of this like, and how did you find new ways to be more accurate in your pre-assessment? So Doug, that's obviously yours. <laughs> uh, sure, so I think there is a way to bring this up that doesn't, like Joan was saying, make you sound like a philosophy professor uh, <laughs> and more and more accurate for, for a boardroom type setting, right? Um, I think the question I always pivot to in these types of scenarios, right, is, Let's assume we were successful in building this data product. What happens next, right? And I think this is like the dog mail truck conundrum, right? It's like, okay, you have machine learning now. What do you do with it? And I think that's where you normally get people who would walk into an unconscious bias situation nine out of 10 times mm -hmm. because they'll say something like, oh, well, I would do this. And you're like, is that really the fairest way to handle that, right? Is that really what you I would do with that? Um, or you ask them a theoretical question of, well, what happened if, you know, this section stopped reporting in? What would happen? Do you feel like the results would still be accurate? And you kind of phrase it as different theoretical questions around it. And you don't necessarily have to mention ethics or call anyone's morality into question, right? But just kind of ask them some contextual questions of, you know, what would you do in these types of different scenarios? And I think some of the stuff that you see around these new ethical discussions and, and frameworks really encourage you to think through, like, what is the next step? How would you handle kind of variation in the data? Like, what does that really imply? Without mm -hmm. necessarily, like I said, calling, you know, making it personal or confrontational in any sort of way. I Very do good. have something to add to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, John. When he said he was curious about breaching the conversation without sounding like a distraction, um, I mentioned this um, at, 
up front in this discussion, but I think that sometimes um, the ethical thing is also the same thing, one and the same thing that will also make your business stronger. There is a lot of literature and a lot of research on, for example, around diversity. It is the ethical thing to do, to, to try to promote diversity for the benefit of those diverse candidates or, 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 or whatever. But the literature also says that, that diverse teams have a stronger perspective and are better at problem solving. This will support a stronger business and will support your bottom line. So having those discussions about uh, ethical things or ways to proceed um, don't have to always be about doing the right thing for someone else. It can be about doing the right thing for yourselves and your company and making it stronger. Yeah, and, and I'll just add to that too. You know, we look at, for example, algorithms that uh, determine whether or not someone's going to get an interview for a job. And we look at it from the perspective of we unfairly biased against a candidate, but that company also potentially lost a very valuable member of the team. So yeah. um, I just going to, I know we only have a couple minutes left. I just want to ask one quick question. I'll get both of your responses on it because uh, Joan, obviously, you know, at URI, you work with students all the time. I know you bring Doug in for those conversations sometimes as well. What is one thing that each of you could provide, one just quick hit of advice that each of you could provide for a prospective data scientist or data professional as regards to how to approach ethics in their career? I'll start with you, Joan. Oh, you're going to make me go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the one big thing that I would say to students in approaching ethics. Actually, um, I've been teaching a class for students, and, and one of the things that... Um, <laughs> Just to be practical and sensible about this, some students want to do the right thing, of course, for other people and for themselves and so on. But other students want to, some of them are thinking about starting their own businesses. And they recognize that if they do something unethical or uh, illegal, that they could lose their business. So, you know, thinking about, you know, having them to have the in the forefront of their minds and thinking about actually uh, um, lead to their their own success. Mm. Doug, what about you? One piece of advice for a prospective data science professional? Um, I mean, I think for me, the advice would be to just slow down. Like I think, you know, the, yes. the, I think we see all this kind of rushing to get the highest accuracy right or rushing to get the data product out. But I think like it's okay to slow down and to think and evaluate and to review what you've produced and see if it makes sense, right? Like there's going to be no ethical critical thinking process or, or metric measuring if you don't build in the time to even consider it, right? Like if you're just barely making deadlines, that additional process, if it's not already baked in, is not going to happen. And I think you see that like the greatest analog is to the software process, development process, right? People were very resistant to having software developers stop and review and, and ref, genuflect and reflect on what they had done previously because they were like the sticking away development time. But actually, it showed that it led to much you know, higher quality development, much faster development because they were able to improve their working process and their working agreement. I think the same thing happens here, right? It's like build it into as a regular check on your process, just like you would for software quality. Thanks for I that. I like that. Yeah. That's a good answer. I like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'd like to thank you both, Joan and Doug, for participating today. I think this was a great discussion, and I, you know, I know it's the first of many more. Um, I want to turn it back over to Joe Devine because, uh, you know, as he mentioned at the outset, we've, we've got a series of uh, discussions on this, and uh, I know we're going to have some over the next few months. So, uh, Joe, can you let uh, folks know what's coming up? Of course, and uh, boy, awesome! Thank you to the three of you for stepping up today and getting us started on this real important conversation. I don't think we could have started any better. So impressive, the three of you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have um, a couple. Well, first of all, our data steering committee is is churning out ideas uh, programmatically that I want to run through a few things quickly to let you know about what's coming. But specifically with this data ethics series, our plan is on June 11th to have a follow-up conversation on specifically on COVID. I know we started touching on that today. We had some great uh, touch points going into that. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into it on June 11th and on July 16th. 
the topic around data ethics will be considering the size of your organization. You know, does it matter if you're an enterprise level company like Johnson & Johnson or a smaller company um, like Blackburn Labs? You heard from Julie speak uh, last week or the week before on data. You know, these are we're going to have some folks from different sized organizations and we'll be exploring, you know, what that might look like, you know, depending on the size of your organization. We also have a series starting probably in about two weeks on data driven leadership and data driven culture. And that'll be a four or five series uh, program series as well, looking at issues starting with um, do you have a um, strategy for data? You know, some basic some basic core elements that uh, you need to really consider and how to build a culture of data and uh, having a leadership team dedicated to a data driven organization as well. Um, on a uh, more user base, we're going to have uh, some Tableau and Power BI sessions coming up soon as well. And then finally, we're working on a uh, domain series around data where we'll have domain experts talking about how data is being utilized in their areas like marketing data, retail data, legal healthcare data, um, and on and on financial data. So we're looking for that. It's going to be a, a long, a lo much longer series. So really couldn't thank you three anymore for uh, getting this conversation started today. Kudos to you and for getting this important topic going. So thank you all for attending. Rob, amazing job moderating. Fantastic. Great work. Kept it conversational. I was just, I don't, I don't no, nobody left. Everybody had to listen to the whole thing. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank everybody thank for you. listening in. And thank uh, you. We'll be Thank back with more. Check us out on our uh, webpage at uh, tech-collective.org. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Have a great day. Have Stay safe, day. everyone.